to, to students in England, in the United States, uh, the subject I am talking about tonight, it, it's a world which, of course, seems very alien uh, to them. A and this provides a challenge uh, for uh, the historian. This is what the historians are m supposed to do, take us back to past times and try to understand why people acted in the way that they did. Not to justify them, not to condemn them, but just to understand them. So this is the historian's task. And this is what I want to do this evening uh, by taking you back to the Middle Ages, to people who were considered as heretics, uh, to a crusade which was launched against them, and to the institution which arose at that time which we call the Inquisition. Now, all these words, heresy, crusade, Inquisition, they evoke images in our minds. But undoubtedly, the word Inquisition uh, evokes the m m most. So I'm going to give you two famous images of the Inquisition. They, they are by the Spanish artist uh, Francisco Goya. This is the Spanish Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition against the Jews a mass of churchmen and some cowering figures, uh, uh, Jews who had converted and then found still, been found still to maintain their beliefs as Jews, uh, wearing the San Benito, uh, intimidated and humiliated. Uh, here is another. This is by Goya as well, a drawing by Goya. It depicts a Christ-like figure, bent, humiliated, chained to a rock. The drawing is entitled, For Having Discovered the Movement of the Earth. It is the great astronomer Galileo Galilei, chained by the great enemy of reason, the Inquisition. And it should not surprise us that Goya depicts it thus. Uh, the philosopher Voltaire had written, the great Galileo, at the age of four score, ground away his days in the dungeons of the Inquisition because he had demonstrated the irrefragable proofs of the motion of the earth. I'm going to return to that first picture later on. But the problem here is that Galileo was never chained to a rock. <laughs> he was never tortured. He was never cast into a dungeon. Uh, whatever his merits and demerits as a man and as a scientist, Galileo was condemned as vehemently suspect of heresy because he appeared to contradict scripture at the time when the church was fighting against Protestantism. He spent 18 days with a manservant under arrest at the six-room palace of the prosecutor in Rome. <laughs> then, after his trial, to the house of his old friend, uh, the Archbishop of Siena, Piccolomini. Then to his own villa uh, uh, near Florence. This is a very powerful image. But the role of the historian is to unfold the powerful layers of images, to pierce through the many myths, to arrive at the historical truth for a full understanding of mankind. So now let me go back to the Middle Ages. I'm traveling around a bit in time and space. So I hope you will allow that. So uh, the period after the fall of the Roman Empire in the West uh, and the settlement by Germanic tribes is traditionally referred to as the Dark Ages. Uh, some historians don't think that's entirely fair, especially because this is the time of some of the great saints, St. Benedict, uh, uh, St. Pope Gregory the Great, uh, the Venerable Bede, and, and many, many m m more. But it's certain that when compared with the great Byzantine Empire, 
in the East and the Islamic world in the South in the same period, Western Europe seemed the, the poor relation uh, economically, politically, militarily. But gradually, as agricultural methods improved and population grew and external threats weakened, the societies of the West began to take shape. Uh, and the period of the 11th century, and even more so the 12th century, proved to be one of the most exciting times in the history of Europe, where one has the sense of real, dramatic change and development, and so historians talk about this period as a period of revolution. More and more towns are growing up. Uh, merchants are traveling ever greater distances, so that the world is beginning to connect up. Knights are going off to the Holy Land on crusade. It's now that people say that the idea of, of romantic or courtly love is born uh, with all its uh, complex rituals, uh, often the subject of the poetry of the troubadours. Uh, great uh, cathedrals arose, first in the style of the, the, the Romanesque. Uh, some of them the great and living monuments of the, the world, and, and great cathedrals of thought arose as well. That is the universities, uh, which are the Middle Ages and Europe's great gift to uh, mankind. This is a medieval lecture. You can see medieval lectures are just the same as modern lectures in pretty much every way. Uh, and you have this guy up there who's going on, and, and you have some people paying attention to him and writing things down, and some other people chatting, and you have this guy here in the corner who's fast asleep. <laughs> this is a society which is expanding and diversifying, and it's also a society which is profoundly religious. Uh, so historians who can't understand that this society is religious just cannot understand <coughs> Uh, the period at all. The salvation of the soul is the most important matter, and hell and the torments of hell are the most real and present uh, danger. Here is uh, uh, a manuscript, uh, uh, Hortus Deliciarum, the, the Garden of the Delights, which we don't still have. This, is, this was copied down in the 19th uh, uh, century. This is from the 1170s, and you can see depicting the various torments of hell, the various levels of hell, the people who are uh, 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 going to uh, suffer those torments. Who could avoid hell was a matter of some debate, and certainly there were monks who thought that the answer to this question was that they, the monks, could avoid hell, but few others without the help of the monks. Uh, the laity at times took a more optimistic view of their own prospects. Uh, and which was the best, best path to heaven was the matter of most prominent concern. Now, not everybody was satisfied that the church was the vehicle of God's grace. And Certainly part of the reason for this was that they felt that the church was too worldly. In reality, much of the major criticism of the church uh, uh, came from churchmen themselves, from the popes, from the monks, even from the bishops. But, but, but the, the criticism also came from the laity. And some laity started to form themselves into groups which often questioned quite vociferously whether the church, as it, as it was, offered the path to eternal uh, salvation. Now, I should emphasize that these people are m m minority groups. What is remarkable uh, about this period in history is not the level of heresy, but it's rather the level of orthodoxy. Uh, but of course, ordinary people are not usually the subjects of, of, of people's lecture, lectures. The, the ordinary majority do not always uh, get a look in. But, and they're not going to hear either, really. <laughs> the two groups I want to mention are those called the Cathars and the Valdensians. Uh, I should say something before I go on, because this is quite a, a, a complicated uh, topic. The difficulty that an ancient historian has, say, in talking about Carthage and the Carthaginians 
is that nearly all of our sources, all our source material, comes from the Romans. Uh, and although they were worthy opponents, uh, the Romans did not completely care for the Carthaginians and did not really tend to sh shed them in a good light. Equally, most of our sources for medieval heretics are works written by the Catholic clergy, uh, and the Catholic clergy, of course, did not care much for uh, the, the, the heretics. So this is a problem, a methodological problem for the historian to deal with. Uh, not only were they biased against them, as you would expect them to be, but sometimes also they misunderstood what the, they were trying to argue, and sometimes they misinterpreted their uh, beliefs. Some historians on this theme argue that, as we understand it, the heresy is nothing more than a construction of the churchmen, uh, that they constructed the heresy themselves in order to build it up and uh, destroy it. This is a, a conspiracy theory. The heretics were real. They took part in public debates. Nobody I I invented them. And we do have some inva inva invaluable texts uh, uh, written by the heretics themselves. We do also have some texts written by clergy who were converts who had been heretics and therefore were well informed on the heretics' uh, practices and uh, beliefs. A and we also have here clergy who were often very determined to give a very accurate picture of the beliefs and the practices of the heretics because that was the best way they could fight against them. So with that, I'll carry on. So we might almost always today call the, the first group of, of heretics uh, the Cathars. Uh, it's probably from a Greek word, kataroi, meaning uh, the pure ones. Uh, we, we sometimes you'll see them called the Albigensians. Uh, 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 this, this is rather bad luck on uh, the, the southern French town of Albi because uh, <laughs> Really, uh, uh, they've been uh, stuck with this, and it's because a great saint of the church, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, visited uh, uh, this region. And uh, he, he was actually very well received in Albi. But then he went to other places around Albi, in the Albigeois, that this region of uh, uh, France, and they gave him a, a hard time. A and after that, he associated the area with uh, heresy, and so it became known as, as the Albigensian uh, uh, heresy. Now, today, Cathars and Catharism, they are something of an industry uh, in the south of uh, France, and it, it's in the interests of local tour, tourism uh, uh, that they uh, are made to appear as numerous and coherent a group uh, uh, as possible. Uh, in reality, there are a variety of groups uh, in various areas with a variety of beliefs, uh, uh, and, uh, and the organizational uh, structures are not very uh, developed. But they do have in common First of all, a lack of trust in the Catholic clergy and in the sacraments of the church as the path to salvation. Now at some point, which remains slightly obscure, but in the later part of the 12th century, some of these new groups which rejected the clergy and the sacraments of the church became influenced by dualist uh, doctrines from the East, which granted that our world, the material world, was either the product of the devil who was a lesser being than God, or alternatively, that there were two gods, each of equal power, and that the material world was the product of the evil God. For these groups, human souls were imprisoned in the flesh by the evil God, and only through absolute mortification of the flesh might the soul escape uh, the endless cycle of reincarnation. 
Now, these beliefs might sound rather strange, but they weren't particularly abnormal in the ancient world, nor in the world of the uh, uh, East. Uh, and some of these groups set up their own uh, equivalent to the clergy, uh, often known as the, the good men, or the perfecti, the perfects. Men and women who were considered to live pure lives and could preach and could perform their own uh, rituals considered to bring spiritual uh, benefits, uh, the most important of which was the consolamentum. Uh, this is actually one of the on, the, on your left, the rare depictions we have now of the, of the cathars uh, uh, at work. The consolamentum, a form of baptism, baptism in which the perfect laid his or, or her hands on the believer uh, by which the soul of the believer was considered united uh, with its heavenly spirit. Uh, after this, the most important ritual was the melioramentum, whereby the believer knelt down before the good man, the perfect, three times and said, bless us, have mercy upon us. Now, numerically, these groups were the strongest group of heretics, and they're especially active uh, in uh, the uh, 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 southern region of France. This isn't the best map ever, but the southern region of uh, France and the northern part of uh, Italy. Why these areas? It's not coincidental that these two areas where you see them uh, most uh, active are also the areas where there is no central authority, where Christian kings are almost inactive. There isn't a force there to uh, stop the uh, uh, heretics. So the Cathars are considered the greatest threat to the church. But I also want to mention this other group, uh, the Valdensians, the followers of Valdez, uh, a lay uh, businessman from the French city of Lyon. Uh, who did not advocate extremist beliefs to the extent of the Cathars and was much closer to the Catholic uh, Church. Uh, uh, so for this reason, uh, Valdez is often compared to his contemporary, St. Francis of Assisi, Assisi, but they're actually quite different uh, uh, characters. In, in fact, St. Francis of Assisi was extraordinarily orthodox. Uh, we know from the sources at the time that no heretic would go near Francis of uh, 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 Assisi. Uh, whereas Valdez, in his way, was quite subversive because he insisted on preaching doctrine when the church forbade him from doing so, as he was not a cleric and had no training and could thus, for all of his enthusiasm, lead people into error. Uh, Valdez and his supporters, too, questioned the efficacy of the sacraments in the hands of an unworthy minister, uh, and he and his followers rejected absolutely the taking of uh, oaths, which may not sound uh, like much, except for the society of the Middle Ages. Uh, uh, the society they were living in was in large measure, measure constructed on the taking uh, of, of uh, oaths. So in, in this respect, the, the Valdensians were just as much trouble as the Cathars. Now, because history is about trying to look at things from everybody's uh, uh, point of view, uh, 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 it's certainly the case, of course, that the people who we call Cathars and the Valdensians they did not consider themselves as heretics. It's very rarely the case that people actually say that they are, are, are heretics. They considered that they held the genuine path to salvation uh, uh, and that the church did not. Uh, 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 and they are often very sincere in their beliefs uh, and many of the, the perfects have uh, a reputation for uh, austerity. Now, for most people, of course, who were not clerics and were not Cathars and were not Waldensians, uh, the evidence suggests that where the Cathars were concerned, then there was often a, a very great deal of hostility towards them, and they were viewed as a menace, and they were treated violently by the general population. With the Waldensians, it was a little different. Uh, people often really couldn't distinguish them from other Christians and couldn't really see that they were doing very much wrong. Uh, 
Now, from the viewpoint of the church, from the pope, the bishops, and the clergy, they have an overwhelming responsibility for the salvation of souls. They were burdened with the duty of getting everybody to uh, heaven and saving them from hell. Uh, and it should be said here that uh, somebody who undermined another person's beliefs was not just a light nuisance. Uh, they, were, they were seen as, as something, something equivalent to the way in, in which we might see terrorists now. You know, people absolutely placing themselves outside of society, spreading fear inside society, and ultimately bent on destroying society. Now, terrorists, of course, destroy people's bodies, uh, but heretics, from the church's viewpoint, destroyed not only their own souls, but the souls of other people, the souls the churchmen had a responsibility uh, to save. But the problem for the church was that it really had very few mechanisms in place for dealing with uh, heretics. St. Paul had instructed, uh, had instructed that the factious man should be avoided. Uh, and general practice, which probably won't survive, uh, surprise you, s seemed to be that the, the problem for, uh, uh, to solve the problem, uh, the normal thing would be to push the heretic along into the next diocese. <laughs> Make it the other guy's problem. But clearly with a large group of heretics, this solution was no longer uh, adequate. Uh, preaching campaigns to the laity were stepped up, but this also proved inadequate uh, in itself. And then in 1184, uh, Pope Lucius III, in the decree Ad Abolendam, direct, directed that the bishops or their representatives should at least annually go to parishes where heresy had been reported and investigate it in cooperation with local people of repute and the secular uh, authorities. Those who failed to cooperate with the investigation, uh, including bishops themselves, were to be suspended from office, while those heretics who, who failed to reconcile were to be the subject, were to be subject to the due punishment of the secular power. And this legislation would be re reiterated by the Fourth Lateran Council uh, or, or, of 1215. Uh, uh, it, it didn't have much initial effect, but it's seen as being the foundation stone of the Inquisition. Inquisitio here. Inquisitio means inquiry. It means making an investigation. Uh, and it wasn't just the case that it, it was a matter concerning heresy. It's something which is spreading across the society of Europe. So you could have a, an inquisitio, an investigation, into all sorts of different things. You could have uh, a, a, an inquisition into a, marri a marriage case where well, somebody was asking for uh, an alma. You could have an inquisition into the moral con conduct of a clergyman. You could have an inquisition into uh, taxation to uh, uh, get, get uh, uh, more people to pay. Tax inspectors, they start here. So Now, In 1198, uh, the cardinals of the church elected uh, a brilliant young man as Pope, as Pope Innocent uh, III. He, he was 37. Uh, and we know, in fact, that the cardinals uh, debated about whether he was too young uh, to be uh, Pope. Uh, in the Middle Ages, old age and wisdom are generally viewed as a good thing. Uh, uh, but it's recognised that sometimes the wise can, uh, the young can be wise uh, too. Innocent was a man full of energy and purpose, uh, who's determined to act against heresy, uh, which he considers is destroying the church, 
uh, especially uh, in those areas we saw in the north of Italy and the south of France. He felt very strongly that this was the responsibility and the burden of his office. And he wrote, quoting the Gospel of, of Luke, to whom more is entrusted, more is demanded. In fact, he has more reason to fear than to glory in having to render an account to God, not only for himself, but for all who are committed to his care. He had this overwhelming sense of responsibility for every Christian soul. Now, while Innocent saw investigation and preaching as two paths to combat heresy, uh, and, and remember, he, this is the man, this is the Pope who accepts the vocations of uh, two of the great saints of the church, St. Dominic and St. Francis, uh, he also thought about heresy in a, a new way. And he argued that just as in ancient times, Christian Roman emperors had considered heresy as a treason against their majesty. So much more so was heresy treason and offense against the divine majesty of Christ. So although the Pope did not say, say so directly, since one of the traditional punishments for treason was death, he was allowing that course of action against the heretics. So Innocent believed that the heretics should be converted first through uh, uh, preaching, through word and example, but he allowed for the possibility of the use of violent measures uh, against them. And he sent his own envoys, uh, many of the members of the, the, the Cistercian order, especially into the south of France, to preach and to persuade secular lords to work together with the church to defeat the heretics. But the most important lord, uh, Raymond VI, the Count of Toulouse, uh, failed to do so, uh, even though the Pope and the legates asked repeated, uh, repeatedly for his help. And uh, uh, it's indeed possible here that the Count was simply not in a position uh, to help because his family had insufficient authority in the region. But his hostility uh, towards the presence of the Pope's envoys in his lands was very evident. And then ultimately, Raymond VI was excommunicated, and just afterwards, the main legate of the Pope, Pierre de Castelnau, was assassinated. This was the 14th of January, 1208. Now, whether he was responsible or not, blame fell upon the Count for the death of the legate. And the Pope was absolutely beside himself with anger. The, the, the attack on the legate, as the Pope saw it, was an attack on the Pope himself. And he called a crusade against Raymond's land, since he was a protector of heretics. And this was, at this stage, it was a whole new uh, world because knights often went off on crusades uh, to the Holy Land to fight uh, against the Muslims. But now they were being asked to fight against an enemy inside Christian lands. And the knights responded uh, to this call with, with great enthusiasm, which brought with it a remission of the temporal punishment due to the sins of their past uh, life. Now I should explain here the tactics, the tactics of the, the crusaders. The, tactics of the, crus the tactic of the crusader was to give the people of the south of France the most brutal example of ma uh, imaginable of what would happen to them if they resisted the crusade. And at the city of Béziers, much of do I have the city of Bezier? There we are. At the city of Bezier, much of the population was massacred. Uh, and it seemed very little distinction was made uh, as to whether the, the people were, were, were Catholics or Cathars. Uh, uh, indeed, it was a little later reported that the Crusade's spiritual leader, 
the Cistercian abbot, Anna Amaric, was asked at the time how such a distinction was to be made between uh, the Catholics and the heretics, and responded, slay them, God will know those who are his. Now, now whether he said that or not, the essential tactic of the Crusades was to terrify everybody into submission. And to some extent, this tactic worked. Many of the uh, towns uh, surrendered. Here is the town of uh, Carcassonne uh, with the people leaving, uh, uh, carrying, nothing, carrying nothing but their sins, as one of the, the, the chronicles put it. Uh, and many towns handed over those who, considered, uh, who were considered heretics to be uh, burned. But the appointed military leader of the crusade, the knight uh, Count Simon de Montfort, ha had the greatest difficulty in sustaining pressure against uh, uh, any resistance because of the nature of medieval warfare. That is to say, the knights who were with Simon de Montfort had to serve during a certain number of days. Uh, and after they had served those certain number of days, they received the spiritual rewards that they had on offer from the Pope, and that when they'd done that, they went home. Amen. This meant that the crusade would advance, would besiege, a, would besiege a castle, they would have the castle at the point of surrender, and at this point, many of the knights would just leave, uh, and, 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 and the Count Simon de Montfort would then have to retreat, and this dramatically lengthened the uh, extent of the crusade. But the other problem was that the crusade was in an area of interest to many of the Christian kings of uh, Europe. Uh, in a sense, the assassination of the papal legate is like the assassination of uh, the Archduke uh, Franz Ferdinand uh, at the beginning of the First World uh, War. Everybody has a political interest uh, in the region. Uh, the kings of England and France, the German emperor, the kings of Castile and Aragon. Uh, and this, this sets in motion a major European uh, war. The person who has most uh, interest in uh, the south of France is actually not the king of France, but the king of uh, Aragon, who's built up all this influence uh, in the, the lands of the south of France during uh, a long period. Uh, and the Count of Toulouse, nearly all of whose lands are being taken by Simon de Montfort, is the brother-in-law of uh, Peter II, the King of Aragon, who intervenes militarily to protect his lands and his family, but is defeated and killed in battle by Simon de Montfort. A little afterwards, Simon de Montfort is himself killed while besieging Toulouse, and at this point, the French crown itself uh, has begun to seriously intervene and to take control of the region and incorporate it into France, as happened in 1229 when the crusade was finally ended by treaty. Uh, so the modern country of France is very much formed in these uh, years. They take the lands of uh, Normandy uh, from uh, the English, and they take all these lands in the south from Aragon, and, and France as we know it today is in, in, is in large measure formed at this time. And so the crusade has been a great success for the French crown, but it's not really been a success for the church. Uh, some of the protectors of heretics have lost their lands. Some of the heretics have been cut down or burned. But the reality was that the manner of the crusade and the treatment of the people had stiffened the resistance of many people and made them think less of the church than they did before. Uh, the, the crusade had defeated some heretics, but it had created new ones. Uh, 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 and the new ones were much better organized than, than the old ones. Uh, and the church had lost control of the process which had been started by Pope Lucius III and needed to re-establish control so that instead of a military campaign controlled by knights, there was to be a spiritual campaign controlled by clergy. 
And it was here at the end of the Albigensian Crusade that the Inquisition comes into being. Pope Gregory IX, a relation of Pope Innocent III, in the 1230s formally introduced uh, inquisitions into parts of Europe where it was thought there was a particular problem with heresy. Uh, but the main investigators were not to be the bishops, as Lucius III had envisioned, but what the Pope wanted was something like full-time professional detectives. Uh, men who had a theological training which would enable them to identify heretics but who did not have so many uh, duties already to perform in the, in the way that a bishop did. Uh, and, and he found those in the two new orders of the Dominicans and the Franciscans uh, whose pastoral activities were already winning people back to the church. Now the Inquisition, the Inquisitors, they did not operate all over Europe, uh, but in certain areas. There was never, except for a couple of years, an there was never an Inquisition in England. There isn't an Inquisition, say, in, in Castile. But where they did operate, they were given very extensive powers. They had jurisdiction over everybody uh, in the area they were investigating, except for the local bishop. They were accountable only to the Pope, and could only be replaced by him. And they could re receive anybody at all as a witness to heresy. Uh, the process against heretics was thus taken out of the hands of the knights, and it was put back into the hands of churchmen. Now, if heretics didn't always believe the same thing, then it's equally the case that the Inquisition didn't always operate in the same way. But we do have a good idea from various manuals of instruction uh, 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 of how uh, inquisitions, generally speaking, were supposed to operate. The inquisitor would visit a parish where heresy had been reported. He would first preach to the people concerning uh, the crime of heresy. He would then declare a period of grace which was usually a week, during which those guilty of heresy uh, could make a voluntary confession. And if they told the full truth, they would be given uh, penance. He might then call on particular uh, individuals to be interrogated, or he might ask to interview everybody in the parish. Now, Suspects were generally not told the names of those who had accused them, nor formally what they were accused of, nor in most cases were they given a lawyer to defend them. Uh, the questions they were asked were quite specific, uh, and in some senses for the historian frustratingly narrow, uh, are often concerned with the frequency with which the suspect may have associated with heretics. Uh, 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 and then only sometimes about their actual practices and uh, beliefs. Uh, because often most of the questioning, the purpose of the questioning, was to establish the extent of heresy and the names of the ringleaders uh, among the heretics. If the suspect was found innocent, all well and good. If not, then there were a series uh, of punishments depending upon the severity of involvement and these were generally very carefully categorized. The penances would usually be read out loud in the local church. Now this could range from fasting and additional uh, church attendance to pilgrimage, uh, either locally or to the great pilgrimage sites of Rome, of Canterbury, of Com Compostela, or, or, or in the Holy Land. Uh, and the, the reconciled heretic, uh, easily identifiable by the wearing of uh, yellow crosses that were sewn onto their clothes. It could go further to imprisonment, which in the most severe cases could be solitary, solitary confinement and, and for life until we come to the obdurate heretic who would be handed over to the secular arm 
uh, uh, to be punished by the secular power and uh, their properties uh, confiscated. In the case of people who had already died, who were then found through investigation to have been guilty of heresy, uh, they were condemned uh, and, if possible, their bodies would be removed from consecrated ground and burnt and their houses pulled down. Twenty years after the foundation of uh, inquisitions, in order that obdurate heretics would disclose information, the use of torture was granted to the inquisitors. Uh, torture was allowed in Roman law. Uh, it was part of secular law in, in many places. Uh, here in the inquisitorial system, it was allowed because actual confession was the most important uh, proof uh, 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 possible. And on some occasions, torture to obtain the confession was thought to be uh, necessary. Uh, I should say, uh, the use of torture was, uh, in this period, uh, later as well, uh, was very limited. Uh, something confessed under torture had to be confessed without torture. The torture could not shed blood. It could not cause mutilation or death. Children, old people, uh, pregnant women uh, were among the categories who could not be uh, tortured. Uh, it, it's difficult to give statistics for this period, but it, uh, its practice was uh, rare. And although in the earliest days of the Inquisition, uh, there were some unbalanced characters appointed to the office Generally, inquisitors did not aim for the death of uh, heretics. Uh, handing people over uh, to the secular power was not a normal course of events. Um, I, can't, I can't give exact num I can give some numbers which will help in this, but say, for instance, there's an inquisition in uh, Toulouse uh, in 1245 uh, uh, six. Uh, and in that um, inquisition, they interview 5,400 people in Toulouse. Uh, uh, 184 of those people are uh, made to wear the, the yellow crosses on the, their clothes as, uh, as um, uh, reconciled uh, heretics. 23 are uh, um, uh, imprisoned. Nobody was burned. Uh, the, with the figures a little later on, in the 1310s, uh, uh, 20s, Bernard Guy, who's the most famous of the inquisitors, then uh, we think around uh, 90 people were handed over to the uh, secular power for uh, execution. The inquisitor's intention was the heretic's confession and reconciliation. If a heretic had to be handed over to the secular power for execution, uh, this in a sense constituted a failure because their soul had not been reconciled to God. Now, unlike most of the Crusades, the initial inquisitions, uh, it should be said solely in terms of what they intended to do, were a success. That is, the chances are that none of your friends today is a Cathar. <laughs> but this requires some qualification because it's not only because of uh, the Inquisition that this heresy disappeared. The, the Crusade had helped, uh, but more important were the rise of the friars, uh, the development of charitable institutions, the rise of university learning, the centralization of government, and a lack of attractiveness to a broad number of people of the heretical beliefs themselves. Now, there was no central bureau of inquisition uh, in this period. And when the initial operations had ceased, inquisitions often just ceased 
rather than looking round for a new victim to pursue. Nevertheless, the Inquisition would be used against other groups uh, who were thought to be a threat to the church, uh, including some groups of uh, radical uh, spiritual uh, Franciscans in the early 14th century. Sorcerers, when their practices uh, were uh, directly connected uh, with uh, heresy. The Templars, uh, accused of uh, strange religious and sexual uh, practices. Uh, here, its use was at least in part uh, political, and this was also the case uh, when it was used in a particularly irregular manner uh, during the Hundred Years' War between England and France in the trial and condemnation of Joan of Arc, uh, who would later become a saint of the church. Uh, it took on uh, a new form in the early modern world as an organization of the state in Spain and Portugal in order to ensure the orthodoxy of converted Jews and Muslims. And in a new manifestation again in the 16th century with the Roman Inquisition. And many of the medieval procedures of inquisitions continue in similar form in the early modern world. Uh, but there, the inquisition is something more centrally organized uh, with large bodies of officials, greater political influence, and extraordinarily sophisticated archival uh, uh, records. Uh, it's these inquisitions, which last 300 years, uh, which people are thinking of uh, more when they think of, of Inquisition uh, than those 300 years or so before it when Inquisitions also operate. Uh, uh, here here, here the, 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 the records are, for historian, the records are uh, uh, allow us to be uh, very accurate concerning the, the, the figures involved. Uh, and we know that the Spanish uh, Inquisition saw uh, about 12,000 uh, people uh, handed over uh, to the secular power for execution. The Portuguese Inquisition, just over 2,000. The Roman Inquisition, 1,200. Now, for us today, the idea that anybody should lose their life or be harmed because of their beliefs is abhorrent. Uh, but we can still ask why it is that Inquisition, the Inquisition uh, remains so evocative uh, that as one of my uh, uh, colleagues was complaining to me of recently, uh, the, the president of the current president of the United States uh, used it uh, along with the crusade as the, the classic example of, of Christian uh, uh, intolerance. In, uh, uh, the Emperor Charlemagne is reported to have beheaded 4,500 pagan Saxons uh, in a day uh, during his campaign to convert the Saxons to Christianity. In the early modern period, in Catholic and Protestant countries, four to five times the number of people were executed as witches, as were executed for heresy. Two to four million people are considered to have been killed during the French wars of uh, religion. So I cannot know what the President of the United States has in, in mind, but uh, when, when people talk about the Inquisition, it's often all Inquisitions blended together. Uh, uh, but they're mainly, of course, going to be thinking about the state-organized uh, Spanish Inquisition. Uh, and, and that blend of Inquisitions with the, the Spanish Inquisition prominent uh, represented a Catholic institution 
which could be used in the propaganda of uh, Protestants. It represented a Spanish institution, as Dr. Haas was saying, uh, uh, at a time when Spain was very powerful and envied and hated, uh, especially, of course, to be used in the propaganda of the English. A religious institution, especially to be used by those who hated religion altogether. Uh, an institution which represented the intolerance of faith before the enlightenment of science, which represented the Middle Ages to those who considered themselves modern. And for Catholics as well, it came to be seen as emblematic of a, a value system which they themselves wanted to reject. Uh, now, inquisitions, particularly in their medieval form, uh, uh, may have been more persuasion and less coercion than is often uh, 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 supposed, and certainly more persuasion and less coercion than the crusade which they uh, replaced. Uh, but uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, who, who had been around uh, at the time when this story uh, begins and who, who had to deal with uh, 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 the zealotry of, of some of the faithful uh, had said that faith must always be a matter of persuasion uh, and it can never be a matter of force uh, and it's this view which prevails in, in our own uh, day. Thank you very much.